Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Life Force Academy. If you're interested in doing something right now from your home, from wherever you live, anywhere in the world, that will help you have a really inspired meditation practice, yogic practices that help to keep the body healthy, the mind healthy, especially right now in these times. Keep the nervous system strong and centered. Keep the endocrines balanced. All the important things in this wonderful but very challenging time that we're living through. Check out the Life Force Academy. Just go to lifeforce.yoga. Just type that into your browser, lifeforce.yoga. To begin your 14-day trial of the Life Force Academy for just a dollar. As a listener of this podcast, you get a 14-day trial for just a dollar if you just type in lifeforce.yoga, Life Force Academy. Check it out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Simret, live in Los Angeles. We're almost a year since this album was recorded, live at the historic Wilshire Ebell Theater in Los Angeles. It was an incredible evening, magical. I'll always remember it, and so grateful we have it. Immortalized as this album, my favorite Simret album, live in Los Angeles 2019. Check it out wherever you get your music, Apple Music, Spotify. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you have not yet subscribed to this podcast, please do so. Please leave us a five-star rating. Help us spread the word so more people get to meet so many of these amazing guests. Thanks for listening, everyone. Enjoy. Hey, greetings everyone. This is Jai Dave. Thanks for listening today. We have a really cool podcast episode. Very special sister, someone of great inspiration, great strength, an incredible story. Her name is Wazfia Nazarene, and I'm so happy for you to hear her today. And we had a great conversation. It's a longer one. Uh, her life is filled with so many incredible stories and uh, so this is <clears throat> this is a, a two-hour episode and uh, and I think you're gonna love it actually she is she is famous for being the first Bangladeshi to complete what's known as the seven summits and what that is is she has summited the highest mountain peaks in all seven continents of the world. <clears throat> so you're going to hear about that. That's towards the latter part of our conversation, though. Um, she has so many experiences and, and stories in her life that, that she tells us about and that I wanted to hear about, um, starting most recently with uh, her her experience with the coronavirus and as she says in the conversation she almost died from the coronavirus back in March and this is a woman who you know she her lungs have been tested she's hiked to the top of Mount Everest and other the other great mountain peaks on every continent of the world so that was a that was a fascinating story to hear and that's where our conversation begins in the podcast and then we go back to her upbringing. She was born in Bangladesh. We get to hear about what that was like. Really fascinating. And then her parents, her mother leaving the family when she was just a 12-year-old. And, and, and then that leading, that having just such a profound impact on her life's journey and path. She ends up going to school in the United States and then into Scotland. 
and then eventually she lands in, and you'll hear about all this in the in in our conversation. She lands in Dharamsala in India, where the where the, uh, the largely the exiled Tibetan diaspora is a uh, wonderful place. I visited there myself and loved it very much. And, and she lived there for a period of time and she, she met and became very close with His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, who had a major impact on her life. Uh, she has a beautiful relationship with His Holiness, the 17th Karamapa, another great Tibetan Buddhist leader, master. And uh, you get to hear all about that. Really fascinating, really beautiful. And then her life leads her into, well, she begins activism work uh, for the Tibetan people, and then also for the people of her of her homeland of Bangladesh, and 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 that's where she gets the creativity to begin her campaign to to summit the seven the seven summits, the highest peaks in all seven continents, and um, and she gained great fame for doing so and completed that. Uh, there's an incredible documentary. On Wasfia. It's called Wasfia. It's on her website. It was produced by Apple and it was distributed by National Geographic. It's on her website. We linked her website in the podcast description here, uh, her Instagram page, and everything you want to see about her. And, and you can also find that all on YouTube. Uh, definitely watch that. Uh, National Geographic recognized Naz- uh, Wasfia Nazarene as one of their adventures of the year uh, in honor of her activism and her commitment to empowering the women, empowering the women of her homeland through her work in the field of adventure. And then she was again selected as one of National Geographic's explorers in 2016, becoming the only woman to hold the simultaneous title of National Geographic Explorer and Adventurer. As she was named by Outside Magazine as one of the 40 women in the last 40 years who have advanced and challenged the outdoor world through her leadership, innovation, athletic feats, and by Men's Journal as one of the 25 most adventurous women of the past 25 years. Wasfia is the real deal. She's a beautiful woman. I really enjoyed uh, connecting with her and having our conversation. Uh, we could have even gone longer, but it, we went long enough, as, and still we kind of scratched the surface of her story. So uh, without further ado, my friends, here is the podcast, uh, my conversation with uh, the great Wasfia Nazarene. Well, thanks so much, sister, for doing this podcast. I'm excited to I'm excited to hear your story. I've heard, of course, some of your story. Watched, you know, the, some videos on your the beautiful National Geographic video on YouTube that tells some of your story. I watched. Um, it was like a kind of like a National Geographic TED Talk type thing that you uh. were doing, <laughs> and I loved it. Hey. Yeah, so I heard some of it, but there's so many, so many pieces there, and and I'm excited for our audience to get to meet you. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you. Like, I'm glad that you know everything worked out and our timings matched. Yes, these journeys don't really mean much unless we can share them. So the teachings and the learnings from all of them. So I'm um, I'm really grateful that you're having me on this podcast. Mm. Well, like before going like back, you know, into like the details of your story, like what do you, what is like currently present day, what is it that is driving you? What is it, what is the deeper, you know, the deeper mission that, that keeps you going right now? Well, just a little rewind back to March and April, I got, I almost died from COVID. Uh, So the right now is basically a full new incarnation and a new life and rebirth. So every moment has been very grateful and, you know, full of gratitude. And I am loving the fact that 
I can do so much inner work right now and there is no one out there who is stopping me for or my because normally generally I've had a very back to back to back to back to like just that kind of race mm-hmm. rat race life mm-hmm. not in the mm-hmm. I mean we'll share stories but it's been a lot of journeys back to back to back and I, I was always on a roll so March since March to now is almost what mid what date are we on October we're October 7th Something? Seventh. Yeah. Well, the time we're yeah, recording this, yeah, October seventh. Yeah. So, yeah, just when you practicing sa- what I've been taught. Yeah, when you said you almost died, like, so how bad did it get? Like, what was it? Give it, give us it, the the little nutshell was, of coronavirus. It, Most of us haven't experienced yet, even though so many have. Yeah, not like right, that. It was. I was literally like flying into the U.S. I mean, to LA from Hawaii at a time when it just hit March. 10th 12th mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i suppose i got it in that flight or uh, at lax and later on doctor told me many months later that they suspect it's, it was the strain from italy that came by in new york which was cuz now we know there are more than six strains and you know it also depends how long you've been exposed to it mm-hmm. and you know just to remind like cuz i i before that, I was in a full training regime as an athlete. I was like super fit. Yeah. Uh, but the, I did have a back to back speaking schedule for 12 days. So my end, like no sleep, uh, mm. just going one school to another. And so your immunity hopping. may have been vo- a little vo- uh, been vulnerable for that period. Uh, of time. Yeah. So my, you know, my nervous system probably was down anyway. Um, but I got it at a time when doctors didn't really know much mm-hmm. about it. I was literally told to take a Tylenol and go to sleep. Oh, really? Because um, mm-hmm. they were thinking so that, even Advil, it. don't don't take Advil, don't take it, yeah. this, don't take that, right? Nobody even wanted to take 60, anyone but 65 plus, or you if you had preconditions, which I didn't. Also, as a person of color, like just getting medical help, that was, that's a whole nother story. But mm. that was so, I actually worsened the situation within the first two weeks. And then there was a time when, you know, my breathing stopped. Um, and Your yeah, breathing it's a whole, stopped? Like literally stopped. Um, were you at the ho- you were in the emergency. hospital? No, I was alone in this very house dealing with it myself and oh, called ER scary. and doctors came in f- mm-hmm. uh, at 7 a.m. And this is coming from someone whose lungs have been tested like in the highest of <laughs> altitudes in the world. Right. Um, so, you know, you know, you know, when your body and your lungs, when you have edema, like how, like when your lungs gargles and things like that. So I've, I've gone through all that, but then I got pneumonia and then the infection, even though I was, you know, tested negative, I think, I don't remember the date it's in my journal on April, but I had all these heart issues after that and then lungs issues kidney issues then i got a uti like all basically my entire left channel and also my heart it was just like there were just things coming out the intestine was like not working i was just weak for months Mm. um yeah so it's it's a tornado with that uh has a long trail but during this time you know i did also um have a lot of my childhood trauma get activated which was harder to deal with rather because i can take body pain you know um i have really high tolerance of pain um and i've gone through a lot on the mountains uh but so the inner work was definitely way more harder to deal with Mm -hmm. wow what do you learn from that what like what would you share with people about it having gone through it you mean just the in, virus or yeah, the, virus the inner inject. work? E- e- maybe both or either. Well, for me, it was very important to keep um, a very sane, stable mind, mm. even because. And this is this was at a time, of course, when it, things were very uncertain. You know, no one had enough information, and there was a lot of rumors going on, right. misinformation going on. People were dying left and right, like mm-hmm. because of, you know, how they were misdiagnosed and all that stuff. So I felt for me to because I couldn't sit at that time, you know, do my practices. But for me to just lie down and be in that pain, but like focus on my mind being stable 
and zo- like just switching off from news because mm-hmm. right totally as in as a foreigner news in america ha- is just something that like it, it's so destructive for our psyche and mm. the way the not just news on tv but social media sure. it's it's beyond anything i've experienced in any part of the world mm. and how it adds to our collective anxiety and in individual anxiety and so that was so that was a key learning that you know i am usually very good with retreats uh, anyway because i've had years of practice doing that but that was a time when i even switched off from my relatives everyone and focused on my um yeah just keeping this mind sane and you know like we have a saying or i say like when i was on everest like that mountain gives you an excuse to give up every day mm. uh, every moment pretty much no matter how much you plan and this pandemic like when i had the virus that was how it went for me like no matter how much i prepare next day it would be something else and every moment was a reason to give up um, wow damn yeah amazing i mean i'm so so glad that you didn't give up number one and that you got right and and the other part was like you know i've had dengue i've had malaria i've had other diseases in my life but this was the first time when i felt like no one like even my friends they had they would leave grocery way back outside like people couldn't come near me doctors would come like it took me a week to just accept for my ego to just accept that oh i am really toxic right now like i could literally kill you and i had to make a will because i'm a foreigner here and right. like you know what would happen to my body should something happen to, to go through all that logistics like wow. that part was pretty pretty lonely experience and scary too but at the same time i felt very connected to everyone and everything on this planet um if i may just i know i'm going on and on about it but um uh, right before that i was in hawaii having a very intimate uh you know back-to-back adventures in nature Mm -hmm. so literally when i was going through physical pain here i could feel all these messages from nature and like whales jumping and what we're doing to mother earth like i literally felt like this was so needed at that time i knew that this was not not a two months long thing it's it's just we're going to, this is going to be a long how, and this is, this is what nature is telling us to do is just sit back and look back and really reflect on our greed and what we've, our connection to this earth. Really. Mm. That's, that's what I got from it. I was just talking to um, some aunties of ours in who are indigenous Hawaiian women who grew, mm. grew up on the islands and in Oahu. And they said right now, they're on Maui now, and they said that uh, the they've never seen the ocean as clear as it is right now since oh, yeah. since their childhood. Oh wow! So yeah, well yeah, yeah. Go well ahead. now, I mean, everywhere in the world, like things are clearing up. Wildlife is, I mean, before the fires and everything, but mm. since the virus started, like you could sit in Kathmandu and see Everest from the city, which is an anomaly like really? given Kathmandu's population yeah there mm-hmm. are all these pictures of the entire Himalayan range being able to like uh, even parts of India and like in Punjab, Kathmandu I've city which that, is yeah. huh? I heard that yeah. from the Punjab the, the, the mountains are visible yeah and for for the first time you know every season was close which is which is one of the most commercial mountain on the planet not just in terms of climbing but just nature everywhere so I think it was a well I mean, things will go back, but I don't think we we can ever get back to that same pace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of life. I agree. We've got an interesting few years ahead of us. Yeah. For sure, to figure for out, sure. you know, can we do that? We can definitely do this. Will we choose to do this? And you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Will we choose? You know, what will we choose to do as a collective? It's going to be very interesting. Um. Let's go back to the um, to the your story, the beginning of your story. Um, you were born in uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh, yeah. yeah. What- and 
sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, I was just going to ask you to tell us a little bit about Bangladesh because I don't, you know, I don't, haven't known a ton about Bangladesh. You and I, I just remember, I do some now, but, but, you know, not, not a, still not a lot. And I remember my, um, I remember as a kid, my dad had the George Harrison concert for Bangladesh. Concert for Bangladesh. Yeah, and yeah. that was like the first I had ever heard of it was via that, and we used to play that records in in our home. And then you know I've learned a little bit. I just I still don't know, and I and I feel like I'll probably a lot of others. But when I was reading about it, it's quite large. You know, big population. No, a huge population, yeah. but a very tiny country though. Uh, mm-hmm. It's smaller than the state of Iowa. So what is now Bangladesh was previously East Pakistan uh, mm-hmm. during my grandfather's generation. And so back back in the day, what was India was what is now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. India was in the middle, Bangladesh was East Pakistan, Pakistan, what is now Pakistan was West Pakistan, and it was all one country, right? And then India got its independence in 1947, and then East Pakistan and West Pakistan were functioning as one country with whole chunk of India in the middle. And then, you know, there's several movements that happen over those decades Mm -hmm. uh, that my grandparents and parents generation lived through. But the most important one is the 1971 liberation war movement, uh, which is shortly after which that concert for Bangladesh happened. Uh, But my parents generation lived through the war of liberation uh, because, you know, it was kind of a, uh, the, Clock was ticking anyway because East Pakistan, there was always was, you know, we we have been kind of a very secular group of people, being, uh, mostly Bengalis and indigenous people. So my ethnicity is Bengali, mm-hmm. uh, who a big chunk of Bengalis also live in West Bengal, Calcutta, mm-hmm. uh, in India. Mm-hmm. So Bengali is actually, I believe, the last time I checked, is the fourth highest speaking language in the world oh, after really? China. Yeah, so Chinese, Hindi, English, Spanish. Sorry, fifth. Um, so it's it's a huge amount. A lot of the Bengalis actually live in uh, UK, uh, all over the world. Mm-hmm. So, what is now UN's International Language Day started because Bang- Bengalis were the first group of people in the world uh, to have stood up to save their language back, you know, so there's a language movement because, uh, so we were facing oppression from Pakistan, West Pakistan, and politically, uh, financially, everything was happening in Bangladesh, but we weren't like, what is now Bangladesh, but we weren't getting credit. So, so there was a whole uprising and a nine month long liberation war in 71, which gave birth to what is now Bangladesh. And, our whole constitution was based on very secular values. You may have, we were talking about this earlier, Sufism and Mm -hmm. the Baal music, um, which is kind of based, has very similar like Buddhist and Sufi vibes to it. Um, All of these practices have been kind of passed on uh, orally from teacher to student for centuries, you know? So that, that was kind of the hub in in what is now Bangladesh. Uh, Buddha himself have walked to what is now Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, what is now the soil of Bangladesh was always spiritually very, um, you know, so it was a seat for intellectuals, um, yogis, practitioners, uh, music, um, all religions kind of survived there for Mm. a long time. But then only in recent, so next year is actually going to be 50 years of Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you mentioned the Bangladesh concert because that that happened because there were af- shortly after the liberation war movement, there was a whole famine and, you know, we get the floods all the time. To those who don't geographically know, it's actually on the kind of in the left armpit side of India on the map. And uh, the south of Bangladesh releases onto the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest delta on the planet. So we get mm. the floods every uh, monsoon season. Mm. Um, and all our river, all, all, the whole country is crisscrossed with many rivers, but all our three major rivers actually stem from the Himalayas in the Everest region, goes through Nepal, Tibet, you know, like Tibet, Nepal. And then just, so we basically get the whole drainage from that. Um, so, Nature, like, for example, I was telling you earlier, like, no one 
taught me climate change, we grew up with nature's fury. Like that's so ingrained in our culture. Like we, I grew up in very close to the Delta in the South of the country. And uh, my first few years were there where also the Bengal tigers are from. Uh -huh. uh, there's a mangrove forest, the largest world's largest mangrove forest called Sundarbans where the tigers roam. And so my dad worked in shipping. So my earliest memories are, some of my earliest memories are like being on a boat in our living room with goats and chickens and everything. Like, it's just like, we were just ready. You know, you just, that's what, just what you do for survival. Did you say Even being like, on a boat in our living room? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, you know, when the floods come, it's just so every season you would see uh, the river coming and taking parts of the land. I see. And so, and so rural people actually build their homes every, every other year. And so, I guess what I, what I really cherish now when I look back is that gave me the resiliency. The resiliency of our people is very, very strong wow. and ingrained, you know, yeah. um, and very, a lot of like hard work. Mm. Um, what a lesson on impermanence as well. Yeah, that too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, currently we're, we're one of the worst affected countries for climate change. Mm. Um, Although we've actually done a lot to for um, to mitigate the effects, mm -hmm. but so yeah, so I know that was a long background, but that was yeah, no, that, perfect. So I, yeah. just to tie back, so my parents' generation lived through the war, so I'm for, I'm kind of first generation Bangladeshi or um, the current generation, um, and but from both sides of my family and. You know, just culturally speaking, we grew up in a very um, freedom fighting, like kind of like if you were near Malcolm X or, mm -hmm. you know, like if you grew up with that kind of mm -hmm. vibes, like that's what we grew up in. And and also a lot of, uh, you know, women were as much part of those movements as men were. So I grew up with a lot of strong women, not necessarily relatives, but just aunties and uncles, you know, like we have a whole auntie clan uh uh, in South Asia. And so a lot of like very strong feminine force. Um, and those were instrumental in my, and education, of course, like people are really into finding themselves through literature and music and art and just doing the work. That was the old Bangladesh, current Bangladesh is changing a lot. Um, mm, that's yeah. the Bangladesh I grew up in. Right. How is it changing? I'm sure that's a big question, but in, in terms of, so you grow, you're growing up around lots of art. You're, it sounds like how you just described it. It sounds like you're, you're, there's, you know, empowered, strong women around you as well as men. Yeah. Is that, well, is both that true? Sides. Yeah. Um, my mom was a musician, so I, and you know, she had friends that were musicians. So I grew up in a very cultural, uh, and also like, I didn't, you know, my mom left when I was 12. So, but I grew up in, in a society that was all my best childhood best friends are like some of the country's uh, most, you know, well-known musicians now. Oh, so, really? uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So like, it's just music and culture has been always part of our psyche. And, um, that's just how we celebrate or, you know, we, we celebrate during suffering too. So, but it's a long story, but Bangladesh kind of with the influx of, you know, migrant workers going into Middle East, which is a huge force of our, you know, earning um, a lot of infiltration from Middle East and also Pakistan and other countries. So there's a lot of extremist attacks in the in the recent years, recent decades. Um, just in my adult life, I've had major, um, you know, timelines when like, events happen where several of our free thinker, uh, activists, uh, colleagues, and, you know, writers, uh, musicians, any kind of free thinkers were just killed, uh, mm. like murdered uh, by these planned attacks. In 2016 was the first ever hostage situation that happened. Um, so that's been a very recent, I mean, 2016, which is like four years ago. So it's mm. still recent. So, um, that's been in the works, but, you know, I think I do believe strongly because 
there is the blessings of our ancestors. Millions of people died for the birth of our country and they were, they risked everything, you know? And so ultimately in a, like our soil is so potent, like this generation, I don't think the youth will actually let, let it go to the other side. And youth is almost 75% of Bangladesh. Oh, wow. So mm, yeah. That's hopeful. Yeah. In our country, we say youth is up to 40. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say 50. Right. Life starts at 50. Yeah. Yeah. And then hopefully it's getting older and older. That's the youth. Mm-hmm. What was the spirituality? What was in your family, uh, in your home growing up? What was the spirituality like? So both my parents are Muslims, uh, but my mom was also a yogi. Uh, and she was really into Sufi practice. Like she was a mystic of Mm -hmm. her time. Mm -hmm. My earliest memories is like, uh, uh, do you say, do you know what Darga means? Uh, How would you say it in English? Darga? Uh, Darga, uh, Yeah, yeah, like, uh, um, yeah, shrine. Like, like, uh, yeah, like in Indian, like in Ajma Sharif and all these, like, you know, where the Sufis used to hang out. So my earliest memory as a kid is me and my brother, like, completely freaking out because seeing my mom on stage like singing and like practicing with all these mystic yogis and I see, kind of like a darbar and, type uh yeah yeah like a court like a yeah, yeah. there's not really an english uh translation because Word it's for it because yeah. it's a cultural phenomenon that uh we don't quite have but yeah there, it's yeah it's like you said a good like a like a yeah like a temple-like experience kind of usually with a shrine in them yes and so my mother's lineage so my mom comes from a very uh uh, strong lineage on her side and Uh um, spiritually and so so i was exposed to that and you know the teachings of buddha has been always ingrained in my um you know he he is known to bengalis but Mm -hmm. even though like I don't know who actually taught me that. Like it was just no mm-hmm. Buddha left his home for the person, you know, like mm-hmm. the whole idea of self-actualization and all that. But my dad's side is um, Sunni. I mean, both sides are Sunnis, but they're in terms of practice, they're very moderate. Um, mm-hmm. We're moderate. Um, but then my parents, you know, I didn't grow up with them from 13 onwards. So that whole shifted it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but Another earliest memory is me being like a pretzel as a kid because my mom's teaching some other people yoga and she would just put me on a knot, like Uh just, you know, so, but, you know, we weren't taught like the way it's practiced in here. Um, Mm -hmm. I would beg to her to teach me. Uh, I had to prove myself. So yoga was ingrained. So it was all like open, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but I also recited the Quran. I also prayed five times. I Mm -hmm. also fasted and Mm -hmm. did Ramadan Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Okay. Wow. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Are you, are you open to sharing what happened at 12, 13? Yeah, sure. Uh, My, Well, it's a very long story. So in short, uh, my mom just decided to leave the marriage Mm -hmm. after 23 years of being married. Mm -hmm. And uh, we woke up one day to find out she was gone. And I didn't hear from her for till I became an adult. Wow. And many, many, many moons later. And you were years close later. previous to the, to that experience? You were Oh yeah, super close. Hmm. Um Do you have siblings? I have an older brother. Mm-hmm. And so um he so when this incident happened, we were in a city called Chittagong, which is in the southeastern part of Bangladesh. And many people who knows or have been following the whole Rohingya refugee diaspora or uh, situation in Myanmar. Um, it's the world's largest crisis right now uh, with the refugees. They're my, they're basically coming into that part of Bangladesh uh, in exile. Uh, so that's where I grew up. And so when my mom left, I was kind of in a nine to 10 month long period just by myself because my you know brother was all day outside playing and my father kind of worked nine to nine. You know, uh, he wasn't really in response like responsible in handling the kids so 
that's when me and my aunt, I had an aunt in the capital city of Dhaka, uh, which is very different from this region. This is like a hilly, natural area, very peaceful. I called her up and, you know, she she also was very concerned that, you know, I need to move. I need to come. So I moved with her. I relocated with her and her husband at the age of 13. Wow. Um, and then, you know, Dhaka life is completely different. It's almost like being in New York, but less developed um skyscrapers and that kind of vibe Mm -hmm. wow so then you went so you went through your teenage years there yeah and then as soon as i you know was brought there i we kind of my uncle and aunt put me on a you know i'm super grateful to them but i also realized that i became a baggage for everyone in, mm. and all the other relatives because at that moment it wasn't really certain what was going to happen and it was my aunt who i still remember told me that you know just know that tomorrow we might not be here and i was like so at that time we basically what does she mean by I that? Need, what does she mean that, that anything could happen like you got to be on your own and i knew that i had to be on my own right. because um like all of a sudden everything, I, I lost everything I had known, my father, mother, the home we were, grew, you know, we had, we, I had a lovely um, time up to 12 in yeah. terms of the experiences I got, but then everything was taken just wow. like, you know, very great lesson of on impermanence. But this is when I had sat down and strategized that if I was to leave the country or, Mm -hmm. you know, be on my own successful, because if I was in the country, then, you know, there would be a time when I would be married off or, you know, those questions. I didn't want to stay in that kind of loophole. And so I was like, okay, you need to, can you put me in an English medium school? Because in our culture, it's like two modes of schooling in Mm -hmm. Bengali, my mother tongue, and then in English. And at that time I didn't know how to, you know, I was always in a Bengali medium school. And so then she put me in an English medium school. That was kind of my strategy that when my time came of age to go to higher, higher studies, I could leave the country mm-hmm. <laughs> and then fast forward to you know when i turn a bit i guess 18 i applied to a whole bunch of colleges and universities all over the world and then one college in atlanta gave me 100 percent scholarship oh yeah uh, yeah what school and, i mean I, it was called agnes scott college it's one of the smartest u.s colleges now for women very diverse but uh, I got into a lot of schools and colleges around the world, but uh, money was a big factor because no one was, and I, I didn't want to depend on anyone also. And I remember borrowing from my uncle the ticket money. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, so I left the country when I was 18, my own is it, good is big it, girl. Amazing. Is it, what a story already. The, the, um, in in uh, Bangladesh, is is it common for all all women to be have an arrangement like as you said, married off um, at a certain age or certain uh, within certain parts of the culture? What well, certain regions that? for sure. Yeah. But my, you know, I do come from an educated family, and but marriage is always seen as the, you know, it's like this ultimate summit for you. Mm-hmm. But the backstory is that because my mom wasn't, you know, because of what my mom had done, and there was so much shame attached to it, and I had, you know, like I wasn't, I wasn't a good uh, there's not even a word translation in English to describe what we become as the weight, uh, the mm. one that the vessel that's carrying the shame of my mother, basically, because mm. I'm the only daughter. Mm. So I, my worth as a bride had de- depreciated. Oh my gosh. Kind of. <laughs> uh, so I was a heavy burden. So like, I, I, like I constantly got messages that, Oh, I had to be a certain way to get that groom in my life. And, um, you know, first of all, let's talk about like the trauma of a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> like, we didn't like, why would you want to be married off from coming from a family that finished their, you know, I'm not, I don't have anything against the institution of marriage, but yeah. we have a lot of inside jokes about marriage. We, we're, I'm, I'm, we're like constantly joking about marriage because it's such a, like even my male friends, contemporary male friends, yeah. they were all married off. I mean, you know, it's just a cultural thing that you marry and yep. then you have kids and then first kid, then the second kid and the third, like it, it's a never ending thing. They're never happy. Um, mm. 
Mm. I remember when I first uh, had come home from finishing the seven, climbing the seven summits, more than celebrating that, there were aunties and uncles saying, oh, now you're finally ready for your final summit. And, of you know, marriage. they were all in marriage. <laughs> yeah. You just did... <laughs> You climbed the highest peak <laughs> of every continent. <laughs> now the real my summit. real summit was waiting. Well, for some and dude. I, what a disappointment, you know. <laughs> right. Give me a break, man. <laughs> but in all love. Just to, you know. Yeah, but just to give you an example. Yeah, that's. Um, yeah, for us, like, you know, if someone who's grown up in the West, that's just, as you know, I'm sure it's just like, it, you, you can't really fathom it. You know, because we grew up, yeah. we grew up, of course, with like this whole other, another, you know, also largely delusional, but a, a totally different paradigm about what right. ma- marriage is, you know. But anyway, continue. No, but so that I just learned to like make jo- every, all our jokes are about marriage and babies, like, because it's, <laughs> it's just so part of ingrained. And um, I remember, and I'm going to sh- we can talk about mountains later, but I remember coming like, you know, my life has kind of just shift shifted completely from 2012 when I summited Everest in Bangladesh, at least. And I was only 29 at that time. And like, I can't, I literally came down the mountain and everyone who had left me in my life were back and everyone that I w- didn't know existed came back. And, you know, with, with that you're, kind of, because it's, you're famous now, essentially. Pride. I'm. I'm. Yeah. All of a sudden, I became a national figure and a pride. I'm on textbooks. I'm on all TV TV shows covers. Like I, I just had everything. But the funniest yeah. part was we were getting all these marriage proposals. Right. All right. I saw that. <laughs> that was so good. People should watch your talk. You did the National Geographic talk, and you showed oh, no, uh, no. you showed the photo that you sent. To, anyways, yeah. the visuals. Yeah. You need the visuals for that. <laughs> So I have my own marriage proposal. So those who don't know, in South Asia, marriage proposals come in like a biodata format in a file. Really? Off the, wow. uh, yeah. So it's like applying for a job. So you have a mugshot of the guy, which never looks like the actual guy. You know, it's just a younger version of that guy. And then it uh, <laughs> plots the who's influential in their father's side, mother's side, how much he earns, all that stuff. Wow. And so we had all these like 50 happy aunties with all these files going around. Oh, this one, oh, oh, this wow. one. Oh, she'll make good babies with this one. <laughs> and so I made my own file with backup mugshots um, with all my frostbitten pictures. Um, <laughs> Just to give them back. <laughs> That's really cool. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> well, okay. So, so you go through, I mean, I can only imagine how traumatic that whole thing is with, you know, you as a, what a, what a time of life too, for a young woman, 12, 13 years old. And, but yeah. you're, you're going through your teenage years and then, but, but sounds like you, you, um, you got accepted into some good schools. And so did you go to Atlanta? Yeah, I came to Atlanta. And you're 18 at this point? 18 going to 19-ish, but yeah. it was not the America I thought I was So what, what did you think you were coming to? Because I've been I to was, Atlanta a lot. I would like. And what time I, period is this? Is this like uh, late 90s, mid 90s, something like that? It's it's late nineties, early two thousand. But it's uh, my vision of American dream was New York, right? <laughs> what we see on TV in popular media, you know. And right. then you're in like this place of <laughs> Atlanta, this town called Decatur I in the Decatur. middle of gun violence. Yeah, um, you know, and Famous I mean, I was via almost outcast. raped. Yeah. Oh yeah, ludicrous, outcast, yeah. all those mm-hmm. you know peeps. But at that time, Atlanta was completely different, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, I was processing a lot. Even though I had left, I was processing a lot because in in high school, I just had to like lit survival, you know, like learn English, learn all these edu- you know modes of um, like every subject in English, pretty much. Like I knew, knew I had to get out of the country, so I was really like on a roll to get out. But once I was on my own all on my own in a foreign country, Um, you know, that depression, the trauma, the anger, Mm. um, the blame of why me, why did it happen to me? So I was, I mean, now I can say it at that time, I didn't know what was going on. So I was not in the best, you know, safest place in my mind. And so long story short, I 
immediately applied for a transfer out mm-hmm. and uh, I got uh, into an exchange program to go to Edinburgh, Scotland, oh. which was major <laughs> change from the, Atlanta, the first semester in Atlanta. From Bangladesh was to Atlanta. To Atlanta, to Scotland. then to Edinburgh. And I initially had gone for six months, but then I never came back and ended up staying there for two years. In where? And the, in Scotland? In Scotland. <laughs> and, and, um, but just real quick, like, so, yeah. So when you get to Atlanta, I grew up in the Southeast US. So oh, really? I'm, uh, so I'm curious, you know, um, yeah, like, so, like, I can only imagine it. How do you describe, like, what you experienced, like, when you land and, and start to experience, like, this, Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I still remember my flight was into New York and then from New York to Atlanta. And mm-hmm. in New York, I came, came out of, mind you, this is also the first time I'm being independent. You know, like, I'm right. just like this, right. I made it out right. on my own. You're going to college, like, right. Yeah. And so for a Bengali woman, like, and also... I had a lot of trauma of seeing my mom being married off at the age of 17. Like every other Mm -hmm. aunt of mine, my Mm -hmm. immediate aunts have been married off as a teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, I have an aunt who got married off at the age of 13, uh, like an immediate direct aunt. So that like, in a way I was like, Oh, I'm going to make it out here. I have had cousins who's done it too, but just like this, the whole gender, the shift between that and this. And so me being independent, uh, but I was, I was not being necessarily very wise and practical. I got into a lot of trouble. I almost got raped in my first semester. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a safe area to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, but my college, I'm mm-hmm. that I'm forever grateful for Agnes Scott College. It was a very small college and private college. So I got one-on-one attention with my professors and I'm lifelong friends with my professors who are, who I call aunts and uncles now, you know, they're like family. So that was very healing. And, um, and how long were and, you at that college? How long of a, a time? So the first was for six months and okay. then I went to Edinburgh and then I finally got a letter from Agnes Scott saying, hey, we're actually paying for your degree. <laughs> so you need to come back if you ah. if you want to. Grow. So I had to return from Scotland. And then I remember taking summer classes in UNCA, which I believe is very near where you grew up. So what is that? Oh, University of North Carolina, Asheville, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Because I I was doing a double major, so I had to add a lot of things to, and my grades uh, had gone down. What was your major? So I came in as theater, and I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer, but that never happened. Then I changed it to theater and something else I don't remember. But ultimately, I ended up with psychology and studio art double major. So, and are uh, you sp- are you speaking English at that time? Yeah. yeah. So by this time, I've already done my uh, O levels and A levels, which is the English. Uh, British mode of education. That English. that was in yeah. like high school in Bangladesh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so then you're Atlanta six months, Scotland two years. Yeah, and then I come back to Atlanta, uh-huh. and then I graduated from Atlanta. But on my last semester in college in Atlanta, I got another grant um, to go study how women were using art as therapy uh, oh. in India. So oh, this wow. is where everything changed. Okay, uh, I see. Cool. Um, and did you like it in Scotland? Oh, I had those two years were the time of my life. Oh, like yeah? just, I had the, you know, me lived, found the friends that were going to like literally change courses for me, uh, in my life. And, you know, just being Scotland, Scotland has like the natural, just, I don't know. Have you been there? Never been. No. It's like the, one of the most naturally magical mm-hmm. place and mm-hmm. it's very potent, you know, like yes. you feel the spirit there. And, uh, I worked for Scott Trail as a, they call, <laughs> call me trolley dolly, uh, <laughs> which is the woman that takes a trolley and sells stuff in the train. So I, I through Scott Trail, I, I used to go all over Scotland oh, uh, on a train and got to see pretty much every, that's the national train. So, uh-huh. um, that was my work. And I think I got a lot of healing from just the highlands, you know, being out in nature there and the circle of friends and, um, the life that I had there, very innocent, but good, good company. Beautiful. Very spiritual people. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. 
So, so you then get this grant you said to go to yeah. to study uh, what was it art as therapy in India or something like that. What yeah, did- so different different ways of using art as therapy, and so. Um, I mean, it was a long program, but one of the last locations that we went on that tour uh, were in Dharamsala, uh-huh. which is in the northern tip of India. Yes. And for those who don't know, um, this is, if you look at the map, it's it's very, it's a very actually politically volatile area because it's on the, the uh, west of uh, Kashmir, mm-hmm. and then on the other side is the Tibet border. So that Dharamsala, even though it's tiny on the map in Himachal Pradesh, it's a very sensitive area. And this is where the exiled community of Tibetan refugees are located, uh, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama is located. Uh, and it's in short, it's called Dhasa to match with Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. But uh, this is basically the capital of exiled capital of Tibetan movement. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love and it. And this H- was had a you been, life. Sorry, had you spent any time in India when you were younger? Did you? Did, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So my mom, like I mentioned, in the shrines and stuff. So those are all in Ajmer Sharif. Those who've listened to uh, Fana Fi Allah, a lot of their songs are actually on those dargas, uh, mm-hmm. Sufi Kawali music. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my mom was a musician too. So we we would go India. India and Nepal were like. Nepal was, I think, I, my first trip to Nepal was when I was nine months old. So those two are like very close to home. And, you know, you go there since like we made a lot of trips uh, as kids. Yeah. So. Cool. So your final part, so you're, you're on this journey studying and uh, you end up in Dharamsala. So in Dharamsala, that was a changing, life-changing time for me, that trip, because, um, you know, here I am, I'm living my life, studying and everything, but in inside, I was very not in a good place. And all of a sudden, I come across this group of people, these Tibetan nuns and the community itself, uh, who were using meditation to... So these women had actually gone through a lot of physical torture in Chinese prisons, um, you know, the the Chinese government actually had a program to sterilize Tibetan women. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them didn't even know till they came in exile that they couldn't even have birth, give birth anymore. Mm -hmm. Body mutilated, like physical trauma, mental trauma, tortured for years. But then like, you know, these people lost their homeland, language, culture, but they're here in exile praying for those people who harm them and not just praying for forgiveness, but also for their good karma. Mm. And this was such a huge slap on my ego. It's like, you thought you had it bad. Like think about these people. And I still remember, I was like, just crying nonstop in their presence, but they are like sitting with (laughs) wisest smiles and like really light emanating for them. Not just saying, Oh, I've forgiven, but really practicing. And, you know, the more time I spent in that trip and then like everyone had that glow. And I just knew, I remember my, the Dean of my professor who was on that trip, she was telling me that you are just in your elements here. Uh, Anyway, but I just realized that I had to come back here at whatever cost. So at that time, the timeline was I was going to come back, get graduated, and then move to, I already had a job lined up for me in San Francisco with Amnesty International, and I was going to move. But on that flight back from Delhi, I remember I didn't want to leave Dharamsala Mm -hmm. in that bus trip. How long were you there that first time? I don't even remember, a few weeks. Um, Yeah, But I just, long enough... Um, it wasn't about the land. It was just, just like the realization that this is your, your spot, you mm-hmm. know? And then I came back, I had a yard sale <laughs> and raised enough money. I, I decided on that flight back that it does, I don't, and you know, this is at a time when very few people had work permit, especially international students. And I already had a work permit. I had everything lined up in America, the dream. Right. right. And I just knew I didn't, it wasn't for me. So I didn't even ask anyone. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell anyone. I told some professors, they helped me, you know, they came and bought stuff from my yard sale. I had enough money to buy a one-way ticket to Delhi. And yeah, I 
decided on that plane, had the Yarsa and took that giant leap of faith that uh, I need to go back. And I went back and I actually had to make another trip back to Bangladesh to withdraw my work permit. And I still remember the American embassy counselor was like looking at me and I had to repeat it three times that I didn't want it anymore. He's like, are you sure you don't want it? You're sure it's a withdrawal? I was like, withdrawal. So, you know, because they have to put, put a seal on my passport. And he was just like giving me the looks like you are the dumbest person I've ever met. <laughs> and then go back. Anyway, so long story short, I moved to Dharamsala. And at that time I had a couple of hundred bucks probably in my pockets. No guarantee of work, nothing. No uh, guarantee of anything really what, what I was going to do next. Uh, I just knew I had to go back. But You had a place things, to stay? Nope. No place to stay? Nothing. Uh -huh. So what happened? I just... I I just ended up meeting one person after another to all these things just came together. And in within a fraction of weeks, like I was staying in a hostel, mm -hmm. I got a job, I got involved with several different nonprofits. I shortly after met His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, like all these things just started rolling and life started. And, you know, I ended up living there for years. <laughs> Wait, so how did you meet? <laughs> How did you meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama? You skipped well, that over happened that. a little yeah. later. I yeah. was I started working with, uh, so I was working as a journalist I, uh, for, uh, you know, the largest Tibetan newspaper, uh, not paper, uh, online uh, portal. I was working, teaching English to Tibetan refugees. Mm -hmm. I was working with several different nonprofits. Got mm -hmm. very heavily involved in the freedom movement, got into a lot of trouble. And then I started working on this book. Uh, when you say you're which, talking about the Tibetan freedom movement? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and, and was that a, so, so you're kind of, your pull or your call to be in Dharamsala connected to the people? Do you, what, what was Not that? Not only the people, but mm -hmm. I think the way of life. Yes. And, you know, I've always kind of been drawn, like I was giving the example of Buddha. Uh, I still remember the, my first flight on my own was at the age of 12 or 13 when I took that fl my, I, I was literally taken to the airport by the driver of my father's office to come move to my aunt's place. Mm -hmm. And I still remember being on that flight as a kid, looking through the window mm -hmm. and just knowing that I don't know when I'm going to ever come back. Like, mm. this is like, I don't even remember if I was scared. I just remember like having that orbital perspective, like that, wow. that look out of the window. And then I still remember the flight that I took from Bangladesh to leave the, you know, at the age of 18 or 19. So I have all these shots in my mm -hmm. memory, mm -hmm. you know, the, from the top. Uh, and, but every time I've kind of recorded that in my mind, I had the, I would remind myself of the story of how Siddhartha left everything mm -hmm. and Gautama Siddhartha and how mm -hmm. none of this worldly, uh, you know, it sounds so woo woo if I say attachments, but really attachments no, um, that, doesn't, that were important. That, that doesn't sound woo woo. I don't think. Okay. I think that sounds like, you know, sometimes that gets cast upon, you know, our ways of living in, and and some things are woo woo. That to me does not at all. That sounds extremely blessed and practical. You know what I mean? Like what what yeah. if you didn't have you know, without that kind of wisdom sense that who knows, you know, where, where, where that was arising from and activated from and, and, and how much it probably, I would imagine has been cultivated many times over and over again for you. Um, but you know, that without that, think of, you know, think of the, the effects of trauma, you know, you know they, they put, they, they scan these like monks these tibetan mm. monks brains who've been some of the you know some masters that were went through torture camps in oh yeah and and they can't find in in this is you know I, I would imagine rare but in some of these masters they can't find any any um evidence of trauma right because their compassion over you know or whatever it is their practice is their, so yeah so what a blessing that you have that to like there's so many other perspectives one could have leaving their home other than siddhartha leaving you know the kingdom 
Hmm. Well, that's I, I, very blessed, very beautiful for my, you know, limited perception. Yeah. And I, I, I have so much gratitude because I, you know, the fact, I don't even know what prompted that, but my earliest memory is like, I needed to set myself free, you know, and it, it, I don't know if it comes from witnessing as a kid, my mom's suffering and, or, you know, what my aunts, but I knew that I had to leave. I had to leave and none of this actually mattered. And first I had to establish myself through education because that was my, that was the only key that I at that time knew to be independent until I became independent. Um, But what I was going to say is that whole urge to self-actualize spiritually Mm -hmm. that was deep seated from a very young age Mm -hmm. Uh, because I also, because so much of everything was taken away as a kid, you know, Mm -hmm. your entire root chakra to speak like your home, your everything was shaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got some heavy duty lessons on impermanence very early on in the first 12 years of life. So, um, yeah, so what, what were we discussing? How well, did that come We, we were discussing, well, you're in Dharamsala. I was curious how you oh. met His Holiness and, or what led up to that before. I'm in no rush. You can tell me as much as you want, um, but, you know, or as little, but I, I am totally curious on, on what happens. I think I oh, love Dharamsala. Asking- I, lo- I have only been there once, but my son and I. And uh, I fell in love immediately with that, pl- with uh, the people and the play, just everything, just the culture, you know, the Tibet, the culture of the people there. Yeah. And I think the peace that I saw in them, that really attracted me. Yeah, um, likewise. Like I was mm-hmm. saying, when I witnessed the nuns, you know, pray and I, I, this is in my early twenties and I didn't understand, like I, the philosophy flew and I got a lot of teachings, but I didn't experience it, you know? And I, it was, I wouldn't say it was envy, but it was a lot of like, I want to be that person who feels like that. And I right. think that just being in the community, but it's not just one person's practice. It's not just the Dalai Lama or the high lamas who practice this. This is ingrained in the community, you yeah. know? And when you actually think negatively towards anything, they call you out. Like they mm. will actually say, Oh, it's not good for your karma to behave like that or mm-hmm. to think like that. You know, the fact that violence starts for first in the mind, like these were such, and I come from a very, you know, Muslim society and, you know, I grew up with feeling revenge, you know, not that I felt revenge towards my parents, but I felt like a lot of anger towards my parents. Like, why was it me? Because, um, during my teenage life, I would get updates of how they were raising other kids, you know, and that would really hurt me that why did you leave me? But you can raise those kids. Oh, like, really? so mm. there was constant yeah. comparison and only later I, you know, through therapy and the works that I've done that it's for a child, it's very, uh, normal to subconsciously just blame oneself that I was not good enough. Sure. Uh, if, if any parent has either passed or left you. Um, yeah. so that's a real abandonment trauma. Um, and anyway, so back to, oh, so I was actually doing this work. I started working on this book and I ended up meeting, um, a lot of uh, freedom fighters, like old school freedom fighters from Tibet. Um, you, you were writing a, little, a book? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I started working on a book, which never got published, but mm-hmm. that book kind of, um, I still can't talk about it, but because of the subject of the book, I ended up meeting a lot of the Chushi Kangduk group members, which are the original. So, you know, Tibet is nonviolence, but there is a part of the movement back in 1959 when China invaded the Kampa warriors, the people from the East, like Karmapa, mm-hmm. so in this Karmapa is a Kampa, um, a tamed Kampa, but then the warrior tribe, they, they had a freedom movement and it was actually funded by the CIA uh, for a brief period of time to uh, resist the Chinese uh, invasion. It's a very long story, Mm -hmm. but if people want to know about it, there's a book called Buddha's Warriors by Mm. Michael Dunham. It's a good one to uh, read. So I ended up interviewing some of those fighters and one, one led story led to another. And I ended up with Dalai Lama's younger brother, uh, interviewing him. And I guess it was him 
I'm not sure how it got to His Holiness's ears, but um, yeah, he somehow heard that there was a young Bangladeshi woman in Dharamsala. And, you know, for those who hasn't been to Dharamsala, it's a very tiny hill station. Uh You get spotted very easily. Pretty much every other person in Dharamsala could be a spy. There's Mm. like British spy, Chinese spy, um, Indian spy, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all kinds. So mm-hmm. like word get word gets around. And um, I was actually for my first meeting to meet his holiness, uh, the call came from the office, <laughs> which I couldn't believe. Uh, I got a random call on my cell phone from his office saying, yo, da, 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 Wasfia, um, you know, we da-da, heard about you and would you be up to meeting his holiness? And I, I still remember <laughs> being like, wait, what? <laughs> like, right. are you, is this a question? Is this a joke? Or <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. Oh, then come come in like uh, 45 minutes. And I was like, what? This is like 730. He's a very early riser, you know, so yeah. and he's super punctual. So I was like, where's my sari? Where's Iron? There's like Wait, monster so they rain. called that morning and you want to meet him that? <laughs> oh, wow. So there's like a brief window open that morning. Yeah. And so that was my first meeting with him. But as soon as we met, you know, like, like I've before this, of course, I was covering him for the news that I mentioned, the news uh, portal that I was ca- uh, covering for. So I had come within very close proximity of his holiness many times. And we've had many times met, uh, and he would somehow always notice me maybe because I was the only girl there, uh, Brown, you know, like there's all these foreigners working all the time. Um, so we've had a lot of darshan and like, he would come and like pat me on and just mm-hmm. bless me and things. Mm-hmm. So those had happened, but we hadn't met in person. So, um, just, I guess, because Bangladesh, no one from Bangladesh had before, um, had any kind of personal connection with his holiness. But when he first saw me, he called me his old friend. He calls a lot of people his old friend, but he was like old friend. And so this is when I had no idea about a lot of how Tibetan Buddhism had evolved in Tibet, uh, and, in th- I don't remember if it was that meeting or the second meeting. He he was the one who told me about Atisha. Mm-hmm. Do you know about Atisha the Punker mm-hmm. or you've heard of him? Yeah, but can so, you unpack it? Uh, there'll be a lot of people listening that do not. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Buddhism actually went to Tibet from India. So uh, back. So what what is now va- Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana is a form of what used to have. Uh, existed it would existed in tibet which is the bond tradition and buddhism mm-hmm. so um you know bond tradition is very connected to nature and the elements and uh, but it was taken by mahasiddhas or highly realized beings from india mm-hmm. and back in that time india was you know what is the old india right yes. um, and people and like a golden age of India. Yeah. 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 So, mm-hmm. but you know, it was thriving and students would actually walk for months to get one teaching from their, right. you know, it was very highly prized. And, um, so one, one of the influential teachers, um, is called Atish Dipankar. In short, he's called Atisha. He comes from present day Bangladesh, actually f- an hour from my home. <laughs> and another one is called Tilopa, who is, um, literally from my village in Chittagong. Uh, that's and- amazing. So Tilopa was the, so what is it? Also t- the founding figure of the Kagyu lineage. So right. Tibetan Buddhism is in short four sects, uh, mm-hmm. four schools of thought. Uh, Dalai Lama is the head of the Gelukpa school. Uh, His Holiness Karmapa is the head of the Kagyu school. And there's the Nyingma tradition. And then there's the, um, wait, it will come to me, the fourth one. But all, it's all the same, but it, it's it's an unbroken lineage of teacher-student, teacher-student, teacher-student connection all the way to Buddha's time. Yes. And the oldest, um, oldest of this uh, connection is the Kagyu lineage, which is the Karmapas tradition. And so Karmapas teacher, 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 teacher was Tilopa, right. who is originally from my village. And that's incredible. So, so that you I didn't you're, know all this. So that's what His I, Holiness wanted to tell you or in part. Yeah. <laughs> so and then even when I met I shortly after that I met uh His Holiness Kamapa, 
who at that time didn't really speak good English. And um, the first thing he had told me or looked at me and, you know, we both exchanged this namaste and he just looked at me and said ancestors. Like he said something in Tibetan and the translator said ancestors. And I was like, okay, cool. Like I didn't understand what he meant, right. but that's what he was getting at is, uh-huh. uh, you know, um, Dalai, in many of his teachings, often jokes that, you know, Indians are the students and, or teachers, and we Tibetans are the cellas. Cellas is like a, disciple. Uh, yeah, disciple, a word in Hindi for uh, disciple. He was, he just cracks jokes. So he told me that, you know, he just, he was like, and as soon as he was started telling me about Atish Dipankar, I was like, wow, like this is our, our treasure, you know, Bangladesh's treasure. And I, we, we, our generation didn't, doesn't know about it. So I actually ended up going back, finding the village and, you know, I have a connection now. So that's how it had started, but he has always had, he has never been to Bangladesh and he's always had an interest in Bangladesh. He had, a uh, you know, close connection with, um, uh, when the war happened, he there was a lot of Tibetan soldiers who actually went to East Pakistan to fight our war. Mm, this 71. is a story that a lot of, yeah, mm. um, as part of Indian Army. So he's always had that soft corner. So, mm-hmm. uh, and as you say, you know, it's all karmic relations, really. Mm. So we grew that friendship. And, but, you know, I met him at a stage in my life when I had no role model to look up to, mm. like father, mother, older brother, like nobody, you know, mm. no, no hope, nothing. I was in a very, I wouldn't say hopeless because I, I was still going, but there was, there was just this empty vacuum in me, mm. you know, um, mm. and being in Dharamsala and because of the work I did, I had to travel a lot to Nepal as well at that time, like the entire Himalayan belt, really a lot of location with the refugees. The refugees are scattered throughout. Like if you look at the map, like Tibet is on this side. Um, I, I was going into Tibet to, uh, for some campaigns and then Nepal, like it's just that whole belt. Right. And so and when you said the work, that, you're, the work you're doing is the work you were doing with the Tibetan with the nonprofits, diaspora. Uh, with the, yeah, yeah. With the freedom movement. And then I got caught in 2007, um, and got banned by China. That's a whole nother story. I'll get into right. that. But during that time, those journeys really like those big journeys really enabled me healing in nature and with the right group of people, really like family. Uh, I remember who actually told me, but someone at that time had told me that your family is a group of people who love and care for each other. Mm. Um, And I found that family there, but it was also his holiness who had in one of the initial, you know, friendship days, he had told me, you know, he always does this thing when you, say a very sad story and when he heard my story about my parents he was like well um there are two times in a human being's life when uh we're the most vulnerable one is right after we are born and the other is right before we pass mm. because we're like if we if we exit the normal way like get mm-hmm. old and mm-hmm. get ill and then pass then we're dependent on someone else's mercy to take care of us and that is a service uh, that is uh, that you cannot like um ever repay that that um that debt mm-hmm. that debt kind of mm-hmm. thing and you know he said that at that time and i was like ah. I don't feel so he asked me if my parents were there because there are children who are born in war zones there are children Mm -hmm. who are born and then left by moms at Mm -hmm. that time you know so I said yeah but and then you know he was like um he said it very nicely so I'm not being able to articulate it and he says it so short and sweetly like it just you know in his presence everything just appears in your mind everything comes down and but the gist of it was like look back on that you know look back on those memories and then try to find the practices that we were doing at that time the teachings that he was giving to meditate on that forgiveness and I would have a lot of whenever I would think of my father I would have a lot of memories come up you know good memories but my mom I just had nothing you know like it was just there was no memory at all because I was like totally covered with grief and trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I had expressed that, he just looked at me and he said, she did carry, you know, for nine months. Mm. 
and again that was such a slap on my ego <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. i guess so he was basically telling me that there is a forgive there is a way to forgiveness if you if you're open to it like i could do home meditation and then i still remember he pointed like touched my third eye area and he said your time will come and went ha, 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 ha. you know those his <laughs> monstrous laughter like thunderous laughter not mm-hmm. monstrous like in a bad way but right. in a great oh, he has loving a, yeah the greatest laughter yeah, yeah you shake like everyone shake and I, you know at that time i didn't oh, really, really in understand. person you you shake is when he's laughing i mean his whole presence makes you sh- like yeah. i i no matter how much i prepare his he, when he enters the room he is just something like it's just and you don't he doesn't even have to say anything you know he and oftentimes like it took me years to realize that he's making a lot of silly jokes and it's not because he's it's it's because he's trying to make you comfortable yes like and he mm. meets people from every from beggars to like high official state to everyone right for people from all backgrounds all and he treats every single person the same way right uh, and yeah it's it's no matter how much i prepare for i usually have to write it down because i forget in his presence your mind just automatically settles you know and you don't remember anything it's such a elevated form of uh, functioning that he does like how he does 24/7. Anyway, so <laughs> I know I went all no, over. It, no, I'm <laughs> I'm so enjoying listening to all uh, every direction you've been, you've gone. I've enjoyed listening to it. So that's that's what this is. It's just yeah, we don't have no format, you know. It's we won't get to everything because your your story that would take like, you know, we'd have to do a whole like uh, you know, podcast series. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, beautiful. Thanks for sharing about your meeting him. Taking a quick break in our conversation to tell you a little more about Life Force Academy. Uh, Life Force Academy is really something for anyone. Anyone, if if you're really wanting to take a deeper dive, not just do a yoga class, you know, for an exercise system, so to speak, but to also do something that helps to tune your mind, tune your sense of being, tune your intuition to what it is your life is all about. If you have a mind, you have a mission, Life Force Academy is designed for that. It's designed to help you have consistency in your practice, to have consistency in your exercise system, to have consistency in meditation practice, and to not only have consistency, but to practice in a way that is substantive. To use practices and to use good yogic teaching, good meditation teaching, good dharma teaching, in order to help your life blossom and bloom. Keep the body healthy, keep the mind healthy. We do live streams each week. There's countless yoga classes. They're thematically organized in different series. Would you like to develop would you like to spend the next few weeks developing your intuition? Would you like to spend the next few weeks uh, working on more of a self-love practices, developing uh, inner courage, uh, d- developing sense of purpose, developing a deeper sense of love and, and compassion, and on and on. There's power practices, quick practices that you can use for whatever it is that you may want or need at the time. Power practice to help you get a better night's sleep. Power practice for first sign of a cold, stimulate the immune system. Power practice, a wake up series to give your body and your mind good energy for the day. Deeper vitality, strengthen the nervous system. And that's just tip of the iceberg. Life Force Academy, we have members in over 60 countries around the world. Uh, it's a beautiful community. There's a there's a forum where you can connect with other people working on the same thing as you. If you go to lifeforce.yoga, that's the URL, you can begin a 14-day trial for just $1 uh, of the Life Force Academy. Lifeforce.yoga to begin a 14-day trial for just a dollar. And uh, 
After that, it's just $25 a month for really countless on-demand yoga classes, live streams every week, and so much more. Exclusive Simrit music. Check it out, lifeforce.yoga. All right, now back to the conversation with Wasfia. So you're working with the Tibetan people, you're working with nonprofits, you get this wonder, you know, this, you know, you, you're blessed to have a relationship with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and also His Holiness the Kanamapa. I think a lot of, you know, in this part of the world, he's not as well known unless you're into, um, you know, Buddhism. But uh, very beloved, right? Can you tell pe- just a little bit? I encourage you to get it to him because he's the real deal. Um, yeah, I mean, he is also, he's my root teacher. Mm. Um, and he's also been very influential in my shaping. Mm-hmm. Um, all in all, I'm very grateful. I have two more teachers. Uh, I have four teachers that, you know, I mean, you get teachings from a lot of uh, teachers, but four teachers that has been very instrumental in my path and um, my shaping. And I am always very grateful that I've had that kind of influence since my twenties. And like I was telling you earlier too, that during this pandemic, this last nine months, uh, I am actually looking back at those years and realizing teachings that were given to me Mm -hmm. that I, that the mind that I had then didn't really comprehend. It was so much, it was so much to process and my mind wasn't ripe enough to, um, extract the nutrient. Yeah. 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 So, Mm -hmm. so a lot of it actually got, uh, incorporated or integrated in the last couple of months, I would Mm. say. And so Karmapa, um, who, for people listening, is much younger than da- Dalai Lama is now, what, 84, 85, did he 86, just? 86, I believe. 86. And um, Karamapa is, uh, what, in his 30s? Yeah, he's 35 or mm-hmm. 6. So Tibetans add a year to Western calendar because they count the nine months in the mother's womb. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever Wikipedia says, it's at, at that one, uh, okay. add one oh, okay. more year to okay. that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's in his, at the most, he's 36 Mm-hmm. Oh no, he's 35. But when you're in his presence, he's like thousands, like his presence, you will not, if I didn't tell you his age, you would not feel that. And now in the last few years, he's, he's really like become into the being that he is, but mm-hmm. the Karmapas has always been, so this is the 17th Karmapa. Uh, like it's the 14th Dalai Lama. So, mm-hmm. which means it's the 17th incarnation of him. And the first Karmapa was the first. So this system is called the Tulku. Like they literally leave um, a poem or note or the way they're going to incarnate in the next, next, next uh, body. So that's how they've been coming throughout centuries. So this, this seventh in Karmapa is according to their prediction is supposed to be one of the most influential ones and there are 21 of them coming buddha himself had actually predicted about the 21 karmapas um and the karmapas have always been um shy of politics like they don't get involved in that realm uh, they've always been very influential culturally like art music and the second or third i forget which which one it was but like the karmapas have been teachers of kublai khan um oh, yeah. yeah and the chinese emperors back in the day like a lot of uh, asian um influence all over Cool. So, like, for example, the Karmapa has more Chinese followers in mainland China than the Dalai Lama, perhaps. Oh, really? So, mm-hmm. and he's also the only one who's been recognized both by the Chinese government as well as the Dalai Lama. So mm-hmm. he could perhaps in the future of Tibet play a role in peace building, but mm-hmm. a role that he perhaps is not so willing to take uh, yes. because it's not his thing. Right. Uh, but for me, like he's called the knower of three times, you know, past, present and future. For me, he's always been the person who has literally called me out saying, oh, there'll be a bloodshed near you. You need to leave. And he's helped me like, he's told me things months and years before things happen. And, um, I'm very like, 
I've, I've been very bla- blessed to have had him in my life, but he's also someone who's taught me since my early 20s. Amazing. And you met him in a similar way, just through, via the work you're doing. There's a- Yeah, I mean, in Dharamsala, that's kind of the two main uh, teachers who were stationed there at yeah. that time. Right. He's moved away from Dharamsala now. Mm-hmm. But um, a friend of mine from Scotland, from, actually, uh, took him to took me to him and uh, he was a young kid and that was the meeting where he like looked through the crowd when I was in the back and I could feel like you will feel like a CCTV looking at you when he's in the room like his presence is so intense um, mm-hmm. and the name he had given me Karma Yusil Lamo um, it means also means uh, it's actually a practice. It's uh, the practice of luminosity of the mind, um, and it's one of the six yogas of Naropa, which was taught to Naropa. Naropa is another great teacher who was student of Tilopa. Mm-hmm. And Tilopa gave him gave him that uh, whole practice, and that's how I found Tilopa in my village, uh, researching my name. So. And six months later, I went back to him saying, oh, did you know that the background to my name was actually related to la, 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 you know, this whole story. And he's just looking and with a spark in his face, like, duh, obviously, I know. Why do you think I gave it? Like that kind of vibe. He didn't say that. But yeah, very, very blessed beings. Anyway, so um, I, from the, you know, 2008 was the Olympic Games, the major olympic games in, in china, chinese right? uh, china, in china, china chinese capital beijing yeah. and that was kind of um, since then things started kind of rolling like uh, you know there was a lot of exposure with a lot of the activism and the movement that with human rights issues in there but i think around those years like they people were like just burnt out from the freedom movement in general, uh, many of us. Um, Mm. And so I ended up relocating to Bangladesh. um, And because you had already been banned. What you said, 2007, you were, yeah, no, just like I just needed to take space from the Tibetan movement because I hit a rock bottom. I see. Just personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, You know, life of an activist since, (laughs) Teen or late teens. Um, so surprisingly, though, Dalai Lama had told me many, many, like in the beginning, he was like, no, your work is with the women of Bangladesh and the world, not not fighting someone else's cause. Mm. And uh, at that time, I was like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I had some karma to dissolve from that. But anyway, so I moved back to Bangladesh. I started working with a nonprofit uh, called CARE and several, you know, I was also a writer. um, So I wrote in many journals, but then after working for several years in the development sector, Bangladesh, for those who don't know, is like a melting pot of all this foreign funded uh, development work that's happening good examples it shows uh good on the resume but it's like it's such a a hippocratic realm over there because you know it's all the foreigners coming in and i mean not all of them but a lot of there's a lot of so i just didn't like the dynamics because a lot of these projects just ended up whenever the foreigner decided um that it was their time to move on and these yeah. people were just left as destitutes you know no with no kind of uh, solution so i was like i i want to start my own foundation but then bangladesh was also approaching uh 40 years in 2011 uh which uh, you know, at that time I need, knew how to do mountaineering. So rewind, sorry, I missed one loop. So I started mountaineering when I was traveling in Nepal and Tibet, like I said. I well, so Early Sherpa 2000s, people, mid to, or like 2005-ish, yeah. whatever. Yeah, and then, no, I actually, well, climbing in general, I think I picked it up in Scotland, uh, but uh-huh. that that in no way compares to the Himalayas. Uh-huh. Uh, but in Dharamsala, you know, from Dharamsala, you could actually go very nearby locations for higher altitude experiences. And then in Nepal, the Sherpa people who are the inhabitants of that 
area. So in um, their language, you say Kumbu. Everest is the colonized name. Kumbu area, Sherpa people originally actually came from Tibet. So I had befriended a lot of these people from my work and just picked up going into higher altitude, higher mountains um, as a hobby. Like it, it wasn't anything planned. It was not like I went to a mountaineering school. My teachers were Sherpa people. And a lot of legendary mountaineers actually come through Taramsala. Uh to pay homage to the Dalai Lama. Uh And so I had a lot of, and a lot of them were actually also in the um, human rights work. So I had a network of mountaineers that I already knew that I just built this community with. So in 2011, when Bangladesh turned 40, I was like, oh, I have an expertise. Uh And I wanted to highlight to the world because by this time, you know, I had already traveled so much around the world. And whenever I would say I was from Bangladesh, no one recognized where that was or, oh, it's India. Like, and it was like, I was like, okay, what is it that I'm very proud of when I think of my country? Uh, What's the first thing that comes? And the first thing is definitely the power of women because, Mm. uh, you know, coming from a very patriarchal Muslim um, background with so many limitations and the progress of women that Bangladeshi women had achieved, it was something, and I don't say that out of a patriotic, uh, you know, place or anything very biased, just knowing Asia, you know, and how far women in Bangladesh had uh, come was something I thought could be a good example to show to the world. So then I came up with this campaign called Bangladesh on seven summits, where I would go climb the highest mountain of every continent uh, to kind of tell the parallel story of what women in the society had gone through to, and we're still going through, but also the progress of women, because I thought it's such a, um, you know, telling story of the mountains that we actually have to climb in society before even getting to the, physical mountains. But I did, when I started it, I didn't realize what I was getting into and how much <laughs> when of you, exposure. Oh, uh, when you decided to do, oh, how much exposure you would get in terms of um Yeah, because I thought public, it was just my uh, activist bag, you know, uh-huh. community and my nonprofit sector. And I put together, because I put together campaigns all the time by this time. And, you know, it was just one of my campaigns. I through so many campaigns and concerts for Tibetan people, for indigenous people in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of like big time activism work before then. So Mm -hmm. I thought it would be just one of those, but Mm -hmm. I I didn't realize what I was signing up for, but also it did work as a force of good uh, for the people, not just for women, for the youth of Bangladesh, because people took it very positively that a woman was going climbing. And we had a team on the ground who were highlighting, you know, stories of women and examples. And there were all this groundwork, grassroots level work that was going on on the ground so while it, I was climbing. So I didn't, yeah, so it has a really, you give it a very uh, kind of positive uh, framing huh? in terms of you're highlighting the richness of something yeah. in, 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 as a way of also... Um, I guess shining a light also on, you know, the transformations that need to take place as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, recognize how far we have come and how far we still have to go, but also where the fact that women were in the forefront of everywhere, you know, women were in the forefront of not just all work sector, but just the resiliency of women. Um, that was something to be proud of, Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so by the third or the second summit, of the campaign, uh, which also somehow magically got timed by the victory day, 40th victory day of Bangladesh. Oh, wow. So I guess news wise, it was, yeah. Uh-huh. And I didn't plan that It because, you know, on the mountain, no matter how much you plan, you're, uh, you're with the elements and you're at the mercy of nature. So you can't time like, Oh, on 16 December, 2011, Mm -hmm. I will be on the summit exactly at that time. You can't time it. It just happened. And so that was at, uh, Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain of uh, South America, but also the highest mountain outside the Himalayan, uh, range. So uh, in the Western hemisphere, um, 
And mind you, to go to some of these places, to actually physically get there was such a deal for a Bangladeshi passport holder because we don't even have diplomatic ties with, or at that time we didn't have any ties with Argentina or Chile or anywhere in South America. So getting to the mountain was, and I was like, Whatever I could, I, I was documenting in my own ways, not through a, I didn't even have a camera or a phone or a smartphone, but it was just, word just got out. A lot of people just grassroots level helped me. I've had women give me their um, kabin money, which is the divorce money that you get after, you know, uh, in a Muslim tradition to come and give me their gold jewelry. I sold my mom's gold jewelry that a little bit of what I had given from my marriage, you know, like just literally shoestring budget, taking bank loans, uh, private loans, just starting off like that because Mm -hmm. these mountains cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about America, but in my country, you can't get a bank loan for climbing a mountain. (laughs) (laughs) You you get it for education or buying a fridge, but, or a car, not for a mountain. It was such a pioneer thing. They were like, wait, what do we put it under? You know? Uh, (laughs) Right. Nowhere to categorize this. So those, the hurdles to get to the mountain was a lot more. And then Everest happened in 2012. And then, like I said earlier, it just, like, so which one? So so the seven summits yeah. are yeah. so what in so in Africa it's Kilimanjaro, which mm-hmm. is the most well known, I guess, and mm-hmm. another very commercial mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, and how in, high is that? How high is that mountain? I can actually. I don't know if you can insert it. Oh, I can actually give you a graph of um, the entire seven summits. Oh, cool! Yeah. Uh, do you do uh, meters or feet? Uh, I'm I'm familiar with feet, yeah. Yeah, here it's uh, more everywhere more else is meters. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Akonkag, uh, sorry, Kilimanjaro would be. Uh, I know it more on meters. So, mm-hmm. let me pull up a very quick one. What part of Africa is Kilimanjaro? So it's in Tanzania, but on the border of Kenya. So you actually see Mount Kenya right from this, you know, it's it's just on the side. Uh-huh. Both countries claim used to claim it, but now it's like you have to go through Tanzania. Um, all right. So Kilimanjaro is 19,340 feet, which is 5895 meters, so almost 6,000 meters. Um, and then... Europe, it's Mount Elbrus, which is in the border of, well, it's in Russia, but it's right around the border of Georgia. So technically getting there was a whole nother issue because the Chechenia movement is going at the bottom of the hill. And that's like another whole struggle itself. Uh, That's 19,340, sorry, um, Elbrus is 18,510 feet which is five, six, four, two meters. And that's how high you're going to the very summit, the very top. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. So the continental summits, um, mm-hmm. so Europe, mm-hmm. Australasia, mm-hmm. Africa. Um, so the first one I went to, to was Africa and then Kilimanjaro. Then I went to South America, which was Aconcagua. Like I said, it's the highest mountain, not off just South America, but also off outside the Himalayan range. Oh, so. Really? Uh, it's 22,829 meters wow. or feet and eight two, or 6,962 meters, which is almost a 7,000 meter, but it's so below the equator. It's literally like bottom of earth kind of zone. So it's it, the mountain actually is between Chile and Argentina, but you climb to the Argentinian side. Um, that it's the air quality. So 3,000 meter in Aconcagua, you would dry out, but in Himalayas, it's it's a lot more humid because of all the trees that are out there, mm. you know? So it's more, so the topography of all these mountains is very different. The skills required to go to all these mountains are very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, so, so I did first of the five back to back within the first one and a half years, like just, tick, 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 wow. then, you know, my, I had to also be in training in between these mountains. Yeah, that's so. what I was going to ask you. So how do you learn to train for the different ecosystems and the different environments? You had a teacher well, I was already something? training before. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. And 
I mean, you train in three different levels, really the cardio, um, you know, the weights and all that stuff that, that is necessary with any athletic feats, I would say, but then there's the higher altitude training that you actually need to get all the training and then practice it out at altitude because you can be the, you know, most highest performing athlete in the world, but you, your mind and your body may not be able to deal with higher altitude. And even if you have been really successful climber, there is no guarantee that next time your body might like, there are many stories of legendary mountaineers, not being able to go above 4,000 meter because, Mm -hmm. because altitude is a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. So training in higher altitude. So I trained a lot in Nepal because that's the cheapest, that was the most, um, and not my Sherpa family is there. So it's an hour long flight from Bangladesh. So you're stuck in more traffic in being in, in the city in Dhaka. So I would just go off to Nepal and train with my, I had some instructors and teachers there. Um, Nima is in the documentary, mm-hmm. who, uh, Wasfia. He's one of my main ones um, who has passed. So I just did various things and then, each of these mountains had to be, uh, before going on to the mountains, the actual preparation of the mountains started months ahead, mm. you know, eight to nine months ahead. And so each of them required different kind of, not just skill sets, but, you know, some, some are just general, like, you know, rescue work, you know, avalanche rescue work, you know, you know, um, the regular mountaineering work. But like before going to Antarctica, for example, I had to really put fat in my body um to how, train how high is the mountain in F- in antarctica uh, so it's called vincent massive which is the highest mountain in antarctica and um also known as mount vincent sometimes and it's sixteen thousand sixty seven feet or 4897 meters but before going to the mountain you you actually to get to the mountain is a whole nother journey you know you <laughs> ski it's all it's all on ice and you literally stay in ice and it's six months you know antarctica is six months sunlight and six months uh nighttime so you're for performing at daylight non-stop i still remember the first day that i came back on a night that I came back to Chile, when darkness came in the evening, I got scared because I hadn't seen darkness for so long. Huh. Um, okay. Oh, in so, Antarctica, it was just light? Yeah, so uh, you, the sun doesn't set for six months, so you go it's during incredible. that time. Does it get it like a little darker in the... No, it, the phenomenon is called midnight sun and mm-hmm. it just gets more like grayish and glittery. So you literally sleep like Hollywood style with sunglasses <laughs> on in your uh, camps, you know, you right. sleep with your sunglasses on. And so that happens in Denali as well, which is yeah. in um, North America, the highest mountain in uh, Alaska. And that one is was a real one for me. Um, I had three expeditions there, almost lost my finger. That one is 20,320 feet and 6194 meters, but that's an Arctic region mountain. So the weather pattern there is completely different. I'm just describing all this to yeah. just give you an idea of all sure. the different kinds of things that you had to learn. But again, one, ble- another huge blessing that had happened for me is like when I first announced, like hadn't announced publicly, but just like within my circles that I was going for the seven summits, I got a random email from a colleague in Tibet. Uh, was like, Oh, you know, I live by, he lives in Canada and, um, like an exile in Canada. And he's like, Nima Dorji, his name, uh, he was like, Oh, I was just having tea with my neighbor, uh, Pat Morrow, and he heard about your campaign from me and he was like, you know, if, if, if there's anything he could offer, I was like, wait, which Pat Morrow? <laughs> so Patrick Morrow is the first person in the world to have done the seven summits oh, before no I was way. even born. Oh, wow. And he's like a legend in the mountaineering world. I used to sleep with his books in Scotland. I still remember like, um, uh, so I would dream about that. Like he's a legend and he's like a very like mythical character at this time for me, <laughs> like, you know, I'm not, I'm not impressed by celebrities ever. Like to me, they're very, like, there are very few human beings who, who, and he was one of them. And I was like, wait, Patrick Morrow is in Patrick Morrow. He was also one of the very, you know, first pioneers who he started the route to go to Antarctica commercially. Like he, he had the connection. So I was like, of course I want to 
can how that and like with several of these connections you know as soon as me and pat connected he took me in he and his wife baiba took me in and he, they never had children so i became their bangla daughter and he invited me over to go train with them uh, in their backyard which is one of the coolest backyard in western canada it's a whole frozen river in winter so i would actually go to him before going to some of these coldest regions uh-huh. because if you fly straight from Bangladesh to say Antarctica you <laughs> might just have a heart attack and die yeah. you know so i would acclimatize and train with him for weeks before flying into um wow. the ice what? and uh, so and so, i must yeah, sorry go ahead. No, go ahead. i must just say that you know although it was it it was a huge struggle it wouldn't have been I ended up finishing the whole campaign in 4 years for various reasons financial mostly but it the connections and the routes and the ways that have gone a lot of it had to be for the blessing of Patrick Moro because he would be introducing me and you know like everyone treats him like the legend that he is he's mm-hmm. a filmmaker too he's been involved in the Tibetan movement as well for mm. many years so mm. I am very very grateful to him and his wife uh forever for making seven summits happen oh, um same with uh going to west papua you know <laughs> which is another crazy zone uh so the highest mountain in i don't know in america what's your seven continent do you say oceania or australia or australasia australia 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 so for rest of the world australia is a country because if australia is a continent what mm-hmm. happens to new zealand yeah good question <laughs> so, so australia has like a little bump uh-huh. uh, where golf carts can go in it's called kosiusku and little kids can go up so a lot of uh we call the fake mountaineers finish seven summits by going up that loop but the real <laughs> mountain is in because mount cook is in new zealand which is a lot more technical mountain and west papua won the karstens pyramid so what happens to the islands that are around that area so those are all part of australasia or oceania mm-hmm. and that mountain I like that name, happens oceania i like it. it's, it's it's called oceania like yeah. so that means like all that region right mm-hmm. if you look in the map new zealand new caledonia and, Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so West Papua is one of the most politically complicated region to get into especially with the Bangladeshi passport and for foreigners as well. So West Papua for those who don't know is not Papua New Guinea it's in the west side of um um what is Papua New Guinea which is PNG but it's politically occupied by Indonesia and when you apply for an Indonesian um uh, visa with the Bangladeshi passport it says all areas except for West Papua so army occupies that territory and then the world's largest gold mine is on that mountain oh, wow. literally on the, that side of the mountain and that's occupied by an American company mm. uh which has its own agenda and guns and thugs and all mm. that stuff so going in <laughs> mm. in that that was the finale of my seven summits so um you know pat really helped me with that one i ended up getting in with bribe but that's the story i don't want to share on public domain but uh Yeah so all those locations where you know and training for them so that's a whole rainforest mud rainforest torrential rain um kind of like avatar looking uh scenery mm-hmm. and then the mountain itself is actually more technical than a lot of the other mountains mm. in terms of the climbing skills mm-hmm. so Carson's pyramid is the shortest mountain on the graph of the seven summits but it's the most technical one so this whole idea of you know the higher the more difficult of course altitude is a big factor but that one is a very tough one too and that one is 16023 feet or 4884 meters wow and then the last one or not the last one but the other only one that i did haven't mentioned is everest which in local region is called chamulungma or sagarmatha by tibetans and nepalis which means mother goddess of the universe or mother mother of all oceans so both very mm. feminine mother mm-hmm. entities mm-hmm. and that's 29029 feet Jeez. <laughs> and uh 8848 meters wow so the highest you can get is that 8888 club what that feel like well 
for me, I think I the fact that I started out as an activist and a human rights worker in that region, uh, because I've been going into Everest region for years, way before I even started climbing. And I was very passionate about Sherpa people's rights, like high altitude workers' rights, uh, which is one of the worst human rights, uh, you know, like, I don't know if you've seen how much of the news comes out here and none of the Sherpa people are actually mentioned, you know, mm-hmm. like they're the whole climbing scene out there. It's that's a whole nother story. But so when I went there, it was a very spiritual journey for me because I was going with the, with my Sherpa friend, Nima, uh, and it was very locally organized. Um, you know, his holiness Dalai Lama was praying for me that like he sent his blessings and he himself is like the uh, leader for Sherpa people. And there was a, there was a whole ritual ritual involved to it it was more like a pilgrimage you know mm-hmm. going to the mother mm-hmm. and before setting fo- foot on everest like before even going to nepal i actually made a will i was ready i had um I had a lot of letting go that I did internally before mm. going, stepping foot on that mountain that I was ready, you know, because mm. I, you literally prepare for death, you know, mm-hmm. before going to some of these big mountains, but Everest I knew was a big, big deal. At that time, I actually had my hair up to my hip and I had promised that if I, if you let me step on your crown, mama, I will give this to you because in our tradition, you know, your hair contains your DNA and it's basically your wisdom. Mm. Uh, and that's the most humble gift or sacrifice or surrendering process that you can do. Um, I mean, it's such a long journey, so I can just say it, say it in short. So the whole journey was two and a half months long, almost uh, oh, wow. three months getting back to Bangladesh. And uh, it gets very lonely out there, you know, like even with even if you're with people, you're, you don't, you're conserving every bit of your energy for the journey. And the journey to the top is only the halfway. Most of the deaths happen on the way down. So Mm. you always have to be mindful of that because a lot of people who die on the mountain actually push so hard to get to the top Mm. is that they don't have anything left. And so you see all these things like tragedies happening on the way down. And then, above 26,000 feet, which is called the dead zone. Uh, For those who don't know, dead zone is where like the human body itself doesn't function. We're not like cells stop reproducing. Um, There's a saying that the more, the higher you go above dead zone, the dumb and dumber you get because you're losing brain cells at a level that it's not possible to um, replace. So you they recommend the shortest time that you can spend up there but as soon as you go you know even before you start seeing dead bodies right everywhere like and then oh really you start seeing dead bodies uh, yeah not just dead bodies but accidents and you know every day you literally wake up with and i was sleeping in sherpa people's tents these are the people who does all the work so you you he like your entire psyche becomes of human mortality every thing, single moment you go to sleep hearing of mortality you like you know that's just in the background and then in the base camp the life i mean over his base camp has become like um like from one end to another it's an hour long walk it's like a whole town itself there's western parties and pubs and clubs going on like these are all set up for it's almost like burning man out there um mm. <laughs> to relate to as sad as it is and this is happening on a moving chunk of glacier um mm. and it, you don't realize it because you can't see it with the eye that the glacier is moving but it's moving it's popping so like you hear sound like tosh tosh so by the end of the season a lot of these camps just go down like just the mom mother just takes it but this is this is kind of like in a what do you call it cul-de-sac like a Mm -hmm. um kind of area where behind us is all the mamas like around everest big mamas like the top of the world the eight thousand meter peak so they're constantly roaring right so Mm. you go to sleep hearing lullabies of avalanches Mm -hmm. uh and you know you have to wake up some nights 2 a.m most of the climbs happen at nighttime so that you don't fall in the heat of the sun which can give more avalanches uh but the last part of everest so you make you know you basically carry load up and down up and down up and down technically you probably climb not everyone does it not usually west or 
other companies pay Sherpa people to carry most of the load. And mm. uh, uh, what happened was on on my summit push, which is the last leg, like after you've set camps on first camp, second camp, camp three, you uh, you don't just go off to summit like that. You wait for the most precious like weather window to open and in recent years the uh, weather window has uh, really because of climate change uh, really tightened up so the season i was climbing 2012 spring season there were only three weather windows so you do this prediction right through the weather forecast but no matter what the forecast says it might not still be same but the traffic that i saw on the first two weather window I just knew if I went in there, I would die because mm. most of the deaths were in recent times happening and which came out to be true. In the first weather window, there was like, I believe seven or in my whole season, 16 people just died. People like we literally had tea or coffee within base camp. So anyway, so all that to say that I had already gone through all that, you know, like just mentally and mind you, it's just me and Nima, you know, and that's it. And mm-hmm. there's Nima and I have a very like sibling relationship, but still, uh, you know, he, we're very close, but we don't talk. Like you're just coming up constantly in your mind to just survive out there. And in the last push, I still remember um, feeling this because my camp three was destroyed and there was no hope of reaching the summit. But when I actually made that morning, uh, which was uh, 26, dis- sorry, 26 May, 626 AM, the last one hour, the sun was coming up. Uh, so you climb through the night. So you have no idea what outside looks like, you know? Um, I mean, you do, but you're just like on a chase to get up, get up, get up. And when the sun was coming up, like the first rays of light, we were on this ridge line, very sharp ridge line, where literally if you fall on the right, you die in Tibet. You fall on the left, you die in Nepal. It's uh, You have two countries to choose from. And I was thinking in my mind, if I've, I'm going to fall on the left because my body ain't coming out from Tibet. But the sun was coming out from the Tibetan side, you know, and it's kind of that awestruck moment when, you know, when you look out from the plane cross Atlantic, like, and you see the curvature of Earth, Mm-hmm. it's literally that view mm. um, and you see that and you're just like <gasps> oh, this profound gratitude of you know holy moly like I'm so tiny on this like mm. grand creation and you know my entire life randomness just random thoughts and people and insignificant memories to significant memories were passing as we were climbing. And, you know, we got very lucky that, you know, me and Nima gained crazy speed during our climb. And we were, when we reached the summit, there was literally nobody. And we sat on the summit and watched sunrise on top of the world, which is also not something that I could have ever planned. And I just, you know, I was crying lungs out, but you know, Nima was like, you got to stop crying, you know, because <laughs> if you cry, right. it forms, um, Ice. Icicle, you know, you can yeah. burn your cornea. And I just remember having this profound, I mean, I always had that realization, but to really experience it of gratitude, of knowing how, what a short time we come to this planet for, you know, and we get caught up in, uh, I remember looking down and thinking, Oh my God, I'm also going to get caught up in that rat race as soon as we get down. And, but we, we are having such a profound experience and how long am I going to be able to hold on to this whole perspective of feeling, you know, I felt insignificant as a tiny bug, but also at the same time felt so connected and so powerful with, um, you know, all the powers that we've been given to make a difference on this planet during the time that we've, and to learn and to share that, you know, the blessings that we've gotten from our ancestors and to pass that on. So, yeah, so it was a very, 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 uh, just for my whole mind kind of just like had a whole twist in the perspective. And when I came down, I was a completely different being. I shaved my head after that, um, because I had promised yeah, right. uh, that I would give it. And then Nima and several other Sherpa people along with the Lama did a whole ritual with that hair. And she, he told me that, you know, your hair and nail uh, contains your DNA. So we have a saying that if you offer it to uh, wherever you offer it, 
you're always connected to that region. And then they did a whole ritual and put it in a stupa on um, the mother's, uh, like around Everest Base Camp on the glacier, there are many stupas and said, now you're always connected to the mother. And so it was a very nice closing ceremony. But at the same time, while all those such great, stuff was happening. There was a whole war going on in Bangladesh on mm. who's going to take my credit. Mm. So I had to, like that glory, that profoundness didn't last for so long. Like I mentioned earlier, as soon as I hit home, things changed for me. <laughs> wow. So, so when it, first of all, all of that's incredible. And, uh, but also I just want to clarify what you meant by that last part. Like when you said there's a whole war going on in terms of, in terms of you coming down. So what was the seventh one was, which was the seventh, uh, summit that you did? No, seventh one was much later, but Everest is, you know, the, I mean, Everest is is Everest. So that itself, but what happened was, so from the summit to base camp took me two days during that time, I I was... I didn't have satellite connection. I mean, I did, but I was focused on bringing myself, my stuff, Nima uh, and our whole team, you know, back to safety. You're not focused on, I made a whole call. So news went out. I see. So I submitted 6.26 AM, um, May 26th by seven. So Bangladesh and Nepal only has 15 minutes difference by 7.20 something AM. There were 180 journalists in my father's house. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> wow. So my father didn't know how to deal with it because he was not someone who should have been credited, you know? So by the time I reached base camp and my, you know, cell phone reception came back and tick, 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 tick to the first I few see. 50 now messages was like... Now everybody wants to be around Wasp. Now everybody wants to claim, you know, credit for so, your... But the actual people who should have gotten credit never, like, at that time... So by this, by those two days, the whole mess was done. The, my... Starting from my father's wife was on the front page of every newspaper. Oh, um, and you didn't have much of a relationship with her. No, this yeah. is a person that didn't accept me, uh, never loved me. So uh, so <laughs> I still remember like crossing Kufu Ice Fall, like seeing my Sherpa family in base camp, seeing this notification, realizing and looking back at the summit and thinking, should I just go back? Because I don't <laughs> want to deal with this right. Like I was in sure, such an elevated yeah. state. Um, and then few, you know, fast forward when I actually landed back in Bangladesh, I was brought with a, you know, first class, like Bangladesh Biman flight, which is a national flight. We got to sit on the cockpit with a lot of food and I'm like, ah, I just want food right now. (laughs) And then I land and there's like hundreds and, you know, like, it's just like, there were so many flashes going on, but even my best friends, my childhood friends who saw me on national TV and like the whole arrival. And if you see those photos, you'll see me smiling. And, but internally I was going through so much sadness and depression and trauma. It was just like mixed spectrum because I, a part of me had realized life would never be the same again. Mm. A part of me was like, oh, now you want me as your kid. Right. Uh, a part of me was like, oh, but I'm going to welcome you. Like, there was just this whole genre. And I did welcome everyone uh, yeah. at that time. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know what damage that was also going to do to me and how, what extent to it, you know, I was going to go to the point where a month and a half of doing like nonstop back to back, you know, just media, media, media and talks and all this stuff and glory and recognition, prime minister's honor, national, you know, I was like, I need to just leave. I need Mm. to leave because I can't, I, this is also the first time when I had insomnia in my life. And Mm. I remember like sleeping in my, so the months before Everest, I really struggled. Right. So I had loans and stuff and uh, I was staying with a friend's parents' couch, and then my father came back and wanted to take me back into his house. And mm. so I didn't, I refused to go because I was like, Where were you? I didn't say that, but I was like, No, I'm going to go back to my friend's family who uh, took care of me all this time. Let, let me have their room. Right. So I, 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 but I would like, I still remember lying there on the bed and just 
recalling those avalanche lullabies, you know, mm. and just wanting to go back to the womb. Mm. And so I, I did uh, the next season. I just like, it's like I ran away from all that. Um, and then since uh, I would say 15 was when I uh, finished the seven summits and then 16 onwards, I've kind of on my own tried to shy down from media. I don't, I barely ever appear. I don't, and not just media, there was like, you know, you get all this modeling offers, film TV offers, uh, drama offers, uh, branding offers, talk offers, like every, anything and everything, including marriage proposals. And mm-hmm. I really had to, this is a time when I, Karmapa also really helped me. Like he, he, he never said you're getting distracted, but he, I just asked him, do you think I'm getting distracted? And all he said was like fame fame is also uh fame is also and i don't remember if he said distraction but it's it's it is a distraction to your path mm-hmm. you know That's and an how obstacle. you deal with it yeah. um so i sh- totally closed off i shied off and to the point where i had ptsd from it i wouldn't even get out i had ptsd from the mountain and deaths I've seen and my best friends dying on the mountain too, but like, Mm. it just kind of, but also at the same time, I realized that I do have a platform to make change for other people and other girls who needs that resources. Like sometimes me going in a village, uh, brings, or maybe perhaps make things better for other girls. And so I started a foundation at that time called Oso, which is my Tibetan name, which is, means the luminosity, which is within all of us human beings. And mm. the whole idea of it, at that time, I had envisioned it to start all over Asia because this, or South Asia to uh, kind of focus on the struggle of South Asian women in general in our societies. But um, I started with Bangladesh, then there was a short chapter in Nepal, which is closed now. And during the pandemic, we basically shut down. But the whole idea was to take adolescent girls from marginalized communities to uh, get out in nature and have all these self-empowering tools through activities in nature to find ways to climb their inner mountains mm. and not to be become mountaineers, mm-hmm. but whatever their mountain was their in their summit. life. Right, their summit. That's beautiful. How do you, how do you transliterate? How is it spelled? It's... Uh, it's like O with the two dots on top, mm-hmm. but you can just spell it O-S-E-L, Osa. Osa, Osa. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And in the show notes for this podcast, we'll have all the links for everyone to, you know, check all your stuff awesome. out. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. You said some, you like just passed by some things that were there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's Good like, luck. we'll have to do it again or not, or we need yet. Are you writing a book maybe? Yeah, so I got a book memoir proposal back in 2016, which I'm only now, four years later, getting back to. Uh And the working title has been Sunrise on Top of the World. Um, Mm. And it goes back on the struggle from my child, like the girl child, to the struggle as a woman in the society, to the struggle on the mountain, told Mm -hmm. through the Seven Summons journey. So... Mm -hmm. It's been a process, but I think I, you know, everything happens when it's supposed to happen. And this not past nine months been very instrumental for me to heal a part of my girl child that I hadn't addressed before. I have done a lot of therapy work. I have done a lot of uh, just healing work in general as an adult, but uh, till I hit COVID, um, I hadn't realized that all the work that I was actually doing was from the 12 year old abandoned child onwards. Mm. And I had actually never addressed the girl that was before 12. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the last nine months I've actually gone back to the first few years and the trauma and the memories of that. And a lot of it was very deeply buried. And, um, you know, we all have inner children uh, within us and, it's been a real process to just integrate those. And I also carry a lot of, like we all do, ancestral trauma mm-hmm. um, and from both sides of my family and just collectively becoming um, all of a sudden this character that 
you know, your people are looking up to. Yes, and right. and the pressure be, of that. The pressure of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most of the offers I've gotten, like I was talking about, I rejected because I didn't, every time it's been like, oh, what example was I setting for the girls at home? Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, but now I'm in a totally different place in my life. And I'm in LA, Los mm-hmm. Angeles, working on TV shows, uh, mm-hmm. which is a whole different, uh, I guess, incarnation. And I'm writing my memoir. I'm also working on a children's book, which is a seven series children's book uh, that's based off my journeys, but it's told through two kids. I mean, to a, a girl and, a, and, and an animal uh, and a Yeti baby and um, <laughs> cool. to teach children how to, how, like, how to do the inner work, meaning that I, I, I always wish that I was taught when I was going to science school, there was a class for mental health, you know, and the stuff I've learned through all the, doing all this work and processing all this work. So that goes into that book. And that's an illustration, uh, seven series. Um, yeah. And then I do a lot of speaking gigs and teach when I can through, uh, that education work. Amazing. Well, first of all, <laughs> thanks so much it's a for lot. well, it's so yeah, I mean there's it was so great. Thank you for uh being willing to you gave you gave us a lot. And uh, thank thank you cuz I hear how all the I hear it now I know all the stuff you turned down. I'm even more grateful that uh you were willing to do this with me. Really. No, it's it's my pleasure. And thank you for having us. And I know that we're at a place where we have to collectively reach. Sorry, my battery is dying. Um, you know, I always say that we need all our brothers in our struggle for the equality movement and patriarchy is a system where women can be as p- much part as men are in the fight for equality. So yes, nice to meet. Uh, fellow brother in the path of self-actualization mm. and ultimately the balance of mother nature. Mm. Beautiful. Well, well, I hope this is the first or it's, it's, uh, it's actually not the first, but the first couple of, you know, many more conversations and, and looking forward to seeing how we can support whatever work you're doing. Thank you so much. I hope so. Yes. And likewise, hopefully we can get to sit in real person and sing someday. (laughs) That'd be great. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, sister. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Thank you again to Wasfia. Definitely check out her website. Go watch that documentary, mini documentary on her National Geographic. Go to her website follow her on instagram all those links are in the podcast description and thank you to simrit for providing us with such a great soundtrack this is the new simrit single just came out G. it's on spotify only right now you can stream and download there If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please do so. Please consider giving us a five-star rating and a review if you like what you've been hearing. Lots of great stuff coming soon. I'm going to let this track ride all the way till its end. Simrit, S-I-M-R-I-T, on Spotify. Thanks so much, everyone.